Hey there, scabby scummers and gangers. Crimson Oracle here to talk about one of everyone's favorite straightforward and exciting topics. Copyright. Okay, I know intellectual property is a dull topic, but good news, this isn't going to be a discussion of the minutiae of copyright law. In fact, this video is mostly about what copyright isn't. Okay, let's get this out of the way quick. Copyright is a legal concept of an artist's ownership of their work, in whatever medium they work, to ensure that they can control what happens to it. This is a very powerful legal right, but it's also fairly limited in how it's applied. For example, in the world of recipes, a list of ingredients and amounts is not something you can copyright. The only thing you can actually own is the prose, the exact text of your recipe, the intro, the instructions, that stuff. In the case of games, you can own the text of your rulebook, but the mechanics and even things like point values are not subject to copyright and only the exact text can be protected. This means in essence that if someone wanted to take an existing game and simply rewrite the rule book, they could do so. You could even take a game you like and adapt it in a new game. And as long as you didn't use the original prose, you would not be violating anyone's copyright. Pathfinder is one of the most prominent examples of this, adapting an older version of Dungeons and Dragons to make a new game. Copyright allows an author or the company they develop for to make money off of their work. And while there used to be reasonable limits on how long this monopoly would last, the effort of the Disney Corporation and others to maintain copyright on existing catalogs has led to an extension of copyright to an absurd length. But while this is a worthy topic to get into in the future, I'm mostly interested here in what copyright doesn't cover. You can own your words, you can own your characters, your setting, but you only own exactly those things. Someone could say, look at another author's character, reinterpret them into a new character, and even then, name them similarly and get away with it. This isn't hypothetical. The iconic Marvel character Deadpool, who you've likely heard of, real name Wade Wilson, was inspired by the extremely similar Deathstroke, real name Slade Wilson. This was fully intentional, and both characters diverged to really be their own things in the end. Frank Miller once made a horrible not-Batman comic in the mid-2000s after everyone at DC told him no when he pitched a really awful idea. He couldn't use the character he didn't own, so he just made up a new, vaguely Batman-esque character and ran with it. The novel Fifty Shades of Grey was literally Twilight fanfiction before being picked up by a publisher and getting some very minimal rewrites to make it legally distinct. Another important thing to note, copyright is one aspect of intellectual property, but there are others, things like trademark, patents, etc. Using someone's trademark in the same market they do commerce can get you in legal hot water, so definitely be careful not to cross those lines. Now, on to our main topic. Did Warhammer rip off Dune? Stop me if you've heard this one before. Thousands and thousands of years from now, humanity has expanded to an empire spanning the entire galaxy, ruled by a corrupt emperor in a complex and declining hierarchy. A charismatic messiah figure arises using a form of prescience, hoping to put humanity on a path of survival in the face of a coming cataclysm. With themes of artificially constructed religion, primitive outsiders coming to conquer the empire, and drawing major inspiration from history, the book opens each chapter with a quote from an imagined historical text. This sounds familiar, right? It's Dune, possibly the best movie of 2021 and a foundational text in the science fiction genre? No, I'm actually describing a series that started being published a full two decades earlier than Dune, Foundation by the famous Isaac Asimov, oddly also adapted last year in the form of a TV show on Apple's streaming platform. It's difficult to overstate how influential Asimov was in the world of science fiction. He was a prolific writer, and Foundation was arguably his greatest work. Foundation builds a history inspired by the historical work The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire. Dune, the sprawling series by Frank Herbert, is in part a commentary on Asimov's work, starting from a similar place but with far different assumptions, and conclusions reflecting the differences in the author's values. Dune riffs on Foundation, remixes it, and builds a world that is ultimately only superficially similar to its inspiration. 
While the two star-spanning empires are similar, they're also essentially just a riff on Imperial Rome, a decentralized empire ruled by a single family, but only with the support of an aristocracy. But while Asimov is interested in hypothetical mathematical prediction of events, something that's grounded in modern social science, taken to its logical conclusion, and enthralled with computers and in artificial intelligence, Frank Herbert instead envisions a future where computers prove to be too dangerous, so humanity adapts our flesh and analog engineering to replace computing devices and artificial intelligence altogether. Herbert is of course also commenting on Asimov's other work, iRobot, with his presentation of AI as an existential threat to humanity. Both books cover vast time periods, but while Asimov is interested in the idea of science as religion, Herbert is instead much more interested in actual religion. And while the scientists slash wizards of the Foundation are the heroes, the equivalent group in Dune are the scheming Bene Gesserit, a sort of dark reflection of the Foundation, whose meddling ultimately leads to horrific results. Both stories deal with cataclysm and the potential of humanity going extinct, but they envision very different paths. Herbert was far from the first author to iterate and build and comment on their predecessors. Far from it. In a way, all literature exists in dialogue with the works that come before it. All writers learn their craft from reading. As many of us were taught in middle school, pretty much all stories can be boiled down to a handful of dramatic themes. Building on those basic themes are tropes, repeated structures that form the building blocks of our story. Science fiction as a genre grew out of the romantic writings in the 19th century, Frankenstein being a prominent example, but also the works of one Edgar Allan Poe, who wrote of balloons traveling to the moon and other such things. These gothic writings were early pioneering attempts to imagine technological marvels, but reflected the fear, quite apt as it would turn out, that technology would not solve humanity's problems, but potentially magnify them. Poe once said, Man is now only more active, not wiser, nor more happy than he was 6,000 years ago. Science fiction would emerge with a less dark, more fantastical outlook in the later half of the 19th century, but a vein of darkness and horror remained in the genre, with Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, War of the Worlds, and others carrying the tradition onward. The dawn of the 20th century, with its continued industrialization and rapid technological advancement, saw the genre grow rapidly in popularity. Lower cost printing led to magazines and comics. The advent of the film camera inspired early science fiction films. Circling back, Edgar Allan Poe also pioneered the detective novel, and it would inspire the author Arthur Conan Doyle to create his own version of Poe's brilliant detective, C. Auguste Dupin, a recurring character in Poe's fiction. Sherlock Holmes expands on the original character and himself serves as the inspiration for countless works, both in character and story structure. One of the fun things about looking at genres at this scale is that we can then track the development of noir from the detective fiction genre, which in turn would blend back with the fully developed dystopian sci-fi genre, itself a descendant of the gothic romance novels, to create cyberpunk. This messy, iterative process plays out hundreds and hundreds of times, thousands of times, and it's responsible for much of the fiction that we enjoy today. Sci-fi would blend with other genres, from military fiction to psychedelia to adventure stories, and weirdly a lot of incest, and that's all just the catalog of Robert Heinlein. By the 1980s, science fiction was as broad and varied as could be, which obviously is where Warhammer comes in. It's often remarked that Games Workshop stole from Dune or Star Wars or countless other franchises that were very clearly inspirations for the setting. That it's all a ripoff, essentially. This is sloppy, and I urge people to stop talking about fiction this way. Warhammer didn't steal ideas because ideas, tropes, general concepts, etc. cannot be owned by anyone. When you make a work of fiction, you own the text, you own the characters, but you don't and can't own the underlying concepts or themes. That would strangle creativity. We wouldn't have science fiction at all if we took that view. Warhammer is, I would argue, popular in part because of how it approaches genre. Created in the 1980s as a game setting meant to provide background for a science fiction version of the game Warhammer Fantasy Battle. Warhammer was positioned as a sort of catch-all for tropes across the science fiction genres 
while importing the fantasy races of Tolkien and Dungeons and Dragons. The original product is tonally all over the place, which I believe was very intentional, with a famously bleak introduction that would set the tone for a new just subgenre, eventually known as Grim Dark. For more than a hundred centuries, the Emperor has sat immobile on the golden throne of Earth. He is the master of mankind by the will of the gods, and master of a million worlds by the might of his inexhaustible armies. He has a rotting carcass, writhing invisibly with power from the dark age of technology. He is the carrion lord of the Imperium, to whom a thousand souls are sacrificed every day, and for whom blood is drunk and flesh eaten. Human blood and human flesh, the stuff of which the Imperium is made. To be in man in such times is to be one amongst untold billions. It is to live in the cruelest and most bloody regime imaginable. This is the tale of these times. It is a universe you can live today if you dare, for this is a dark and terrible era where you will find little comfort or hope. If you want to take part in the adventure, then prepare yourself now. Forget the power of technology, science, and common humanity. Forget the promise of progress and understanding. For there is no peace amongst the stars, only an eternity for carnage and slaughter and the laughter of thirsting gods. But the universe is a big place, and whatever happens, you will not be missed. Reminiscent of the tagline from Alien, in space no one can hear you scream, this intro then segues into descriptions of a future star-spanning and declining empire. Crucially, this setting actually shares very little in common with Dune or Star Wars in the details. Dune is an empire of mankind alone, no other technologically advanced species exists, and the God Emperor is an actual ruler, a despot. Warhammer 40k, meanwhile, features countless alien foes, and the Emperor is a rotting corpse sitting on the magic chair that makes his psychic signature a usable navigation beacon for the entire Imperium. Well, most of the Imperium, until somebody breaks things. Star Wars, meanwhile, features some conceptual similarities, but it's ultimately a very different, hopeful story about overcoming evil. Warhammer is, by contrast, selling itself as an experience where nothing is overcome. Things only decay. Part of this difference is down to the fact that Frank Herbert was reacting to his fear of cults of personality, George Lucas was reflecting on the American invasion in Vietnam, but the creators of Warhammer were reflecting on nearly a decade of conservative rule that had taken grip in both the UK and the US with the election of Thatcher and Reagan. The world seemed to be drifting toward a dark and dangerous future. Whether it be nuclear annihilation, or just rampant capitalism unbound, Maybe both? And science fiction in the 1980s evolved to comment on these issues. Warhammer 40k takes many elements of American science fiction, and it blends them with British satire to create a future that's an extreme version of authoritarianism and fascism. Over the coming decade, countless books, pamphlets, magazines, etc. were released filling in the details of the Warhammer setting. And the influences are all over the place. There's, of course, the Tolkien influence on Warhammer, Michael Moorcock's Chaos Mythos, various mythologies from different cultures, Judge Dredd, Terminator, Starship Troopers, Alien, and in the case of the setting of Necromunda in particular, which dates back to the game Confrontation, a hefty dose of cyberpunk. By combining this wide variety of influences, Warhammer reframes them, reinterprets them, and remixes them into something altogether its own thing. And the process continues as they continue to develop the setting. The Tao introduced aesthetics drawn from anime. Mechanicus have a distinctly Victorian steampunk flavor in their current iteration. And with the upcoming Leagues of Votan, there's a hint that we'll see things from the Dark Age of Technology, before the Imperium's monoculture took over the galaxy. Meaning, we may get a whole new aesthetic from their addition. Beyond the visual aesthetics, Warhammer also strays into a wide variety of themes, with stories ranging from adventures to mysteries to flat-out silliness, horror, time travel, space opera. The setting is a sort of katamari of human culture, absorbing anything that gets too close and retaining it. I think this is in part why Warhammer has proved to be so enduring. No matter what your interest is, what genre you prefer, your stories have a place in Warhammer 40k. 
Grimdark may sound like a very narrow aesthetic, but the truth is that the grim darkness is more of a humorous shorthand than a literal bleak colorless landscape. Characterizing creative remixing as stealing or ripping off misunderstands the very nature of inspiration. It gives people the impression that ideas must be owned, protected, and frankly, allowed to stagnate. It's not surprising that, growing up in a world dominated by Disney, we all got a sense of this warped idea of ownership. But indeed, even Disney's mainstay for a long time was taking public domain stories and taking them as their own. Disney doesn't own those characters, just their artist's depiction of them. And they didn't steal them because they didn't belong to anyone in the first place. The truth is that no author has ever owned their ideas. Once you express a thought, it can spread around the world, it can be tweaked and changed and returned to you as something altogether different, and there is nothing that you can do about it. Frank Herbert himself once said that seeing Star Wars, he noticed a large number of similarities with Dune. He was upset, but ultimately didn't try to take legal action. And frankly, that's for the best. While the themes in Star Wars definitely bore inspiration from Dune, the actual story was intentionally on the part of Lucas, more based on mythical heroes' journeys, samurai films, and the Vietnam War than it was Herbert's meditation on charismatic leadership, power, ecology, or religion. The idea that taking a few ideas was actionable was silly, and Herbert knew that well enough to form a clique with a few other authors that felt Lucas had used their works and called themselves the We're Too Big to Sue George Lucas Club. Ironically, Disney bought Star Wars in the end, with mixed results so far for the franchise. I won't go into that topic now, or we'll be here all day. Moving on, just as Warhammer was a sponge absorbing themes and tropes from every corner of the world, so too can Warhammer be used for inspiration, iteration, and to spawn new works. Just as Frank Herbert didn't own the idea of a desert world or god emperor, Games Workshop doesn't own the idea of hulking transhumans in power armor, or space elves with jester theme, or any other component of Warhammer 40k reduced to its core idea. As a result, we as storytellers, and I firmly believe most people are storytellers at heart, can and should take from our favorite elements, from any stories that we like, and iterate on them, make them into new things. And this again isn't hypothetical. People have been inspired by Warhammer and used its ideas since back when it was a brand new setting. Mantic Games makes a vaguely Warhammer-inspired game called Warpath that a lot of people like, as well as Dead Zone and Dreadball. North Star Military Figures makes models for Frostgrave and Stargrave, both games riffing on Warhammer and Warhammer 40k respectively. And even more recently, there's the example of One Page Rules, a simplified rule set for wargaming that features factions that can represent every Warhammer 40k codex. This is a really cool project. Although personally, I am not a fan of the game, I'm glad it exists as it's filling a niche for the tabletop world for fast, simple gaming, which I want those people to have rules. Warhammer 40k inspired an art movement that initially took the name Inc. 28, but has now expanded to feature a wide variety of ideas and aesthetics and game systems. I particularly love Turnip 28, a setting in a dark fantasy-infused Napoleonic era where there's only war and root vegetables. Some of the coolest models I've seen are from this iterative project, and you should check it out as it's developed into a whole game. Just as these creators took inspiration from Games Workshop's games, many sculptors have been inspired by the work of Games Workshop's sculptors. Now, this is one area where things sometimes skirt the line and cross over into actual copyright infringement, so it's important to be careful about both how closely your work resembles someone else's, but also to avoid using any trademark terms to market your own products, as you'll get hit with takedown requests or nasty letters from lawyers quickly if you cross those lines. There have been third-party models for Warhammer since before I started playing, and now we're in something of a golden age of folks taking inspiration from Warhammer 40k. Fresh takes on factions, cool counts as cons... <laughs> Fresh takes on factions, cool counts as concepts, development of factions that don't currently get included in the game. The variety is endless. This is great. Not only are a ton of small sculptors learning and growing and finding an audience, 
but this provides an endless variety for modelers. GW can't do much to stop it either, since they only own their own designs, meaning that this will likely continue to grow as a part of the hobby going forward. Anyone who wants to riff on Warhammer, create the next cool thing, etc., is free to. That's the best part of all of this. The legal system is designed around fostering creativity. Sure, it isn't perfect, and unfortunately, Games Workshop in the past has misused their power and position uh, with their legal authorities to disrupt people who are creating. And I think that it's often a bad idea. So I generally don't support that kind of uh, intrusive behavior. But what's important is that it's not something that you have to encounter if you are smart and you don't do anything that's legally actionable, but you are absolutely free to take and borrow whatever you want from stories to tell your own stories. You could come up with, for example, an idea that I've had for a long time is some kind of a uh, mix of cosmic horror and the Adeptus Mechanicus kind of body horror setting of a world where different uh, groups of tech priests worshiping various dark gods go up against each other and attempt to salvage whatever technologies are available and slaughter each other in the process. Um, I even have an idea of how I do the rules for this system. I definitely could develop it if I wanted to. Um, it's something I've thought about in the past, but I could crucially do all of this without actually stepping on Games Workshop's toes. I would just need to have a legally distinct idea that would allow me to riff on this. So, you know, in I would need to come up with a name. I would need to come up with new terms for all of the various types of upgrades and all that stuff uh, so as to not step on any of Games Workshop's toes. But it would be a relatively simple process. It's just a matter of wanting to actually do the legwork, which has taken me a little bit longer to even kind of process uh, that idea. But I do know exactly how I would do it. So maybe at some point we'll get there. In the end, it's, I think, a good thing to talk about these issues because it, it's something that people have assumptions about. And I've noticed that this topic comes up a lot. I think that it's fair that people feel defensive about their favorite franchise uh, and in that way want to kind of uh, get credit for it, for the innovations that it offered. And I think that that's fair. Uh, but I just don't like the way that we as a community tend to throw around words like steal and rip off around things that are not property that anyone can own. Um, I think that it's important to make those distinctions. So that about covers uh, my thoughts on this topic. I know that this was kind of a, um, uh, you know, kind of a, a rambly, ranty kind of thing, but I wanted to, you know, put my uh, put my thoughts on this topic out because I think that we are honestly living in the golden age of wargaming. I think that, you know, it's never been easier to put out a, a game. It's never been easier to put out a line of sculptures of models. It's never been easier to tell a story. Um, you know, what what limits us is our own kind of uh, timidness when it comes to taking uh, and it's something that we should learn to do because uh, ideas are not something anyone can own and it's important that we all uh, recognize that and take ideas where we need them to do our own things so that about covers my thoughts on uh, <laughs> the topic of you know did Warhammer rip off any of a uh, countless number of stories and to me, the answer is no. Uh, if they had, they would be, you know, they would be paying royalties. But they are inspired and develop on ideas that were present in many previous works, countless previous works at this point. And I do think that um, that is a lesson for all of us 
about what uh, we should do, what kind of approach we should take towards Games Workshop, uh, which is to say that uh, take the ideas where you can. Um, even if you want to make like a short film or something, Games Workshop says that they'll take legal action if you make a short film set in their universe, which I get. Uh, I understand what that means, but at the same time, I think that it's very easy to set something in whatever universe you want and not necessarily need to be specific about that universe when you actually finish the project. So, you know, obviously you have to avoid iconic, uh, depictions of existing games, workshop sculpts in that kind of situation. But if you wanted to design your own powered armor, that kind of thing, you could very easily make a short film that was, you know, in essence, Warhammer, even in intention Warhammer and still, you know, put it down and make it happen. Um, so that kind of, uh, lays out my thoughts on this topic. It's a lot. So, uh, thanks to anyone who actually listened. Uh, I know that I kind of went on for a bit there. Thanks again to my patrons who help keep this show on the air. Uh, if you were interested in yourself becoming a supporter on Patreon, just search Dome Runners on there and you can find me. Uh, as well, if you are interested in my podcast about Necromunda, I've got like 50 some episodes on there. So uh, check that out in the show notes. There's a link. And of course, everybody out there, stay safe and don't forget to change your paint water.